serious. My name's Chris Ridgway. Thanks very much for joining us. Today, we're discussing the current state of the modern day music industry. Could the wind as you softly spoke you. Uh, now, this is a business that has changed so dramatically in recent years, it is barely recognisable from what it once was. With the realms of social media and internet that everybody uses on a daily basis, providing us with so much exposure to so much music, from blues scenes, jazz scenes, funk scenes, hip-hop, metal, indie, classical, why do we let men in suits tell us what to listen to to suit their corporate interests? Why can't we pick what we listen to ourselves? So here's one for you. Are we now listening to music to form opinion on it rather than to simply enjoy it? Reality shows depicting overnight superstardom is achievable, even desirable. You pay, they play, boys, and Musicians, lyricists, writers, these professions are earned, they yearn for, practiced profusely and dreamed of. Gone are the callous harm and fingertips, blood, sweat and tears in every piece of music and in its place, opportunity aired live to the United Kingdom every Saturday night. Getting sick of all these lads who like to say that they have when they are so You can't go from musical obscurity to the top of the charts in 17 weeks, regardless of genre. It is not possible. It takes 17 weeks to perform on a reality TV show to go from musical obscurity to the Christmas number one. You can't do that in reality. Or can you? Is there a band out there that can prove me wrong? My name is Chris Ridgway and I host radio and I'm a musician. So the idea of the 17 week challenge was to highlight just how unrealistic reality TV is. Highlight all the work and graft that goes into making music. It's not just as easy as stepping onto a stage and singing somebody else's song. How many bands do you know that actually think that somebody's going to come knocking on the door because they've just released a single and they've gone and go, hey, that's really good, that. Do you want to get signed? Don't work like that. I mean, you can do so much yourself at the start and everything like that, but to take it the step upwards, it, it really is hard work. And then you've probably got to have a few grand in your pocket as well, just to help it along the way. Uh, I'm Lewis. I play drums in the Mantels. I'm Dale, I play the bass in the Mantels. I'm Tom Barrow, I'm uh, from Manchester. I'm a singer and guitarist in the Mantels. We're a three-piece band from Manchester. We've been playing probably about 18 months now together. We were approached with this concept, which was the 17-week challenge. And the idea was, I suppose, someone out of complete obscurity will appear and they'll go on a talent show perhaps and then They'll, they'll be massive for a couple of weeks and they'll have a single. What is actually stopping us from doing exactly the same thing? It was, it was just to see what we could do if we threw everything at it. I mean, putting t a couple of hours a day into the social media, putting, getting the best possible quality recording we could do. Just, just everything that we thought that this person, whoever they may be, would be getting themselves. The, the main idea of it was to get a new single down pick a song that we thought would be a good one to release on its own, like a good standalone single, and put that out and see, see, what, see what we can do really in that time. So the 17 week challenge is write a song, record the song, market the song, play the game, and see how realistic it is to get said song in the Christmas charts when all you have is 17 weeks to do it. So now the ball's rolling, we have to start booking gigs. And there's a lot that goes in to booking gigs. It's not just a case of rocking up, standing on a stage, playing your tunes. You're gonna be the first ones in the venue and you're gonna be the last ones out of the venue. You need to be there three, four hours before people show up. So if the gig's on a Friday night, you, you know, you're taking half a day off work. Me personally, I probably had 30 bands before this, you sure. know, and you're always working. And so the main thing when we started was like, are you ready to 
to do this it's gonna be a lot of work and we're gonna play every night we're gonna you know we probably not gonna make a penny for a year and and we just gotta get out and play everything is you know a lot of people sit home now and they and it's cool too you know you write your songs and you work at home and you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse our whole thing was let's get out let's get up on the stage right away and let the kind of the audience decide how it's gonna be If you want to listen on SoundCloud, then you can do that. Just search the man tails. That's how you spell it. So. If I if I was starting in a band now, I wouldn't go via a promoter. Just put the night on yourself. Dead straightforward. If you know two or three other bands that are like-minded with you, it's going to cost you eighty quid, hundred pound tops to put your own night on. One bit of advice that probably I'd give to bands is never play midweek, especially if you're an out-of-town band. You've got no chance. Because all the venues will talk, they'll offer you a gig whenever you want on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because they know hardly any local band will talk to you. Well, the words of advice that I got was to sort of focus on your backyard first, but LA is not really a place for live music. So it's a good place for shopping your music around or licensing, um, but the live scene is really for national acts. Um, you sort of have to be more well known to draw well in Los Angeles. So uh, I sort of picked the areas where people were really receptive and paid attention and liked the type of music that I do. And so far those areas are the Midwest of um, the states, which is right around Chicago, and sort of like the, in the vicinity of that, we call it the Midwest, and then the UK. Um, and out of the, all the places that I've played, those are the two where the audiences and, and the people that I meet and that come to the show and all that stuff are just really open and receptive and seeming to enjoy it. So I've decided that those are my backyards. So that's where I just keep going back and forth between the two. So essentially doing your homework is, is pretty important. I, would, I, I hate homework. I wouldn't say it's homework. <laughs> it's more of just like paying attention to what's working. When you get in your first gig, there might be six people there. But, you know, if there's six people there that enjoyed it and you sell two records, then that's a fairly good return, two demos or two um, CDs, whatever you've got with you. If you've just gone through all this effort of planning the gig, getting it in the right venue, getting it in the right time slot, getting all the right songs in the right order, thinking about what you're going to wear, making sure everything fits, and then only ten people show up, and you know six of them, and the other four are their misses, playing in front of nobody can be disheartening. And then let's get the, uh, oh, I need to go in position now, I'll let you sound like, so let's get the acoustic. Well, last Saturday we played at the Roadhouse, um, it was alright, wasn't it? There was some good bits and some bad bits, wasn't there? Yes, yeah, We had a bit of a nightmare trying to get the sound right, because you couldn't hear the bass. I can't hear the bass. If that's what we got, that's what we got. So in the end, we ended up putting the bass amp behind be out next to the drum kit just so we could hear so the drum kit we could hear it better. Some good feedback and that from the other bands what was on and the people. Yeah, was there. the thing was it was it was wasn't just our crowd as well. It, it was as if it was we were playing to a crowd that was there rather than it wasn't just all of our mates, which is a I think a lot of the gigs we've done have just been packing it out with everyone we know, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think we put as much effort into it as we do with every other gig. I think I don't think there's any sort of priorities. I mean, people probably will be more inclined to turn up if it's free to get in and it's a good venue. <coughs> um, yeah, people like Whereas if, if they're expecting, if, if it's five quid to get in and it's five pound a can, it's not really a redeeming feature, I guess, is it? I mean, so it's I think we need to pick. Out. We need to pick the the right the right gigs really. <laughs> So they're booking shows, they're going out and gigging, but at the same time, they're rehearsing and they're writing songs around work. So if they're working nine to five, or sometimes weekends, they're finishing work and then going rehearsing, and the band are finding out that, that it's not easy. It's a lot of hard work, yeah, we put a lot of time, we put 10 years into it, you know, to get to where we are, so it's, it's a lot of hard work has gone into it. Before we even got a record deal, we did a year of constant playing gigs and 
everywhere in London, southwest London, you know, we played all around Brixton, like every week we'd have two shows. Well, the Arctic Monkeys were probably the last big, if you want to go with, uh, well, to my knowledge, the last big sort of like social media, because they did, if you remember back to MySpace. I mean, I had the first album, they were giving it away, it was Demo Farm, just giving it away, you can, you can download it. But the key there was, uh, they had no record label interest or contact at that particular moment, but they were gigging constantly all the time. And the key there was, I mean, we could probably argue rightly or wrongly all night, that they give away eight tracks, 10 tracks, but everybody that went to that gig, they knew all the songs. So you're not going to a gig, oh, this is crap, I don't know hardly any of the songs. Everybody that was going practically knew the full set. And they were that big a fan then, when the proper version came out, tied up, nicely produced, they were gonna buy it. Our first proper gig in Manchester was, night and day um, and you know like I remember I remember that gig so well and it was like 30 people there no one knew who the hell we were there was maybe a song or two up on YouTube or on MySpace I think it was back then it wasn't even YouTube and you know I, there's still there's still a couple of fans that I met that night that still come to every single show and I still see them every time they come here and chat to them and it's just like it's you know that's something special and there are always going to be music fans who who want to hear different music, you know. Obviously, you know, loads of people listen to Radio 1, but that's just because it's the first result when you put on your radio. And it's, it's not, you know, they're, again, the people who aren't seeking out new music, they're the people who are waiting for music to come to them. So we're at the stage where they've written the track. Uh, they've got the track ready to go, it's now time to record it. Um, at the same time, they're trying to make themselves relevant, they're trying to rehearse and record, they're trying to stay true to what they're doing, they're trying to stay true to their cause. Do it for yourself initially, you know, you don't want to get too indulgent, but like if you, if you don't like the music you're writing then you're doing something wrong. So it's kind of like, yeah, if you write the music for yourself first and then if other people like it, that is a bonus. If your mate says to you, right, I've got access to a recording studio or whatever, don't bother in the nicest possible way. A, because it's your mate or it's a mate of a mate of a mate who really hasn't got a clue because he's only just starting out and it takes forever and a day to get the recordings back, even a, a rough mix or anything like that. Just save up, get them on there, go to a decent studio. A decent studio, a decent producer, you should be asking them to chip in with ideas, really, and try and listen to something that you can't. Don't have a crap recording, because nobody will listen to it. Uh, we chose to record the single in Blueprint Studios in Manchester. Now, I'd say it's one of the more fancy ones in Manchester, uh, a bit more upmarket uh, than what most unsigned bands will probably use. You know, there's a big list on their website people have worked with, like Justin Timberlake, like Snoop Dogg's recorded there, um, Elbow. Elbow have got their rehearsal room at there, they've recorded all their stuff there. I think spending the extra money getting in the better studio is the difference between having your song on the radio and just having your song, someone plays it on SoundCloud, like through the headphones. I don't, I don't think we'd put enough preparation into the actual recording, the thinking about how the, the song was gonna be recorded, like playing it to the click track We'd not really done enough practicing to the click track. A click track is playing to a metronome. A click track is making sure you are all playing at the same speed, at the same tempo, at the same time. You ready? Uh, yeah. Okay. Start playing at the speed you want to play at, and then you're like, oh, and trying to catch up with the well, speed that this is. That's what I mean, it sounds right. It does sound right, but not when, not when we're playing it. The benefits of playing to the click track is that uh, with the mixing and the editing afterwards, uh, everything's in sections, so if you do one bit that's different or another bit you do it wrong, you can just basically chop that out and, and start again kind of thing. They can use the bass from take one. They can use the drums from take four. They could use the third time the guitarist laid his riffs down and they could use the second lot of vocals. And because they're all playing to the same time, 
they will fit, they will dovetail like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, it's good to keep like, old school as well, like, record an 8 track and stuff like, like instead of a kin, but you yeah. got a laptop and that, but I try and work it and I think that, that kind of puts you off writing like, you ain't a fiddle with things and the different technology and it's just the 8 track, you just go bang, just record it, bring it everywhere to go, and so it's good to, because if you get too focused on the, the, the fancy side of it, then you, you forget what, what the songs are about, what you're actually writing for in the first place. Listening to songs on the radio, they'll always be done so a click track and you can hear that. You know, kind of beat going through it. You're playing a lot slower than the click. You're just playing at your own. Tempo. I'm trying to click my foot to the to the tempo, but I keep on losing it. You know the clicking, like you know, in my head. Well, stop tapping your foot and just fucking strum it. Because you're putting yourself to get off. Click to the. Well, you're, you're, playing well, you're playing it to your foot, not yeah, the fucking so. yeah, click track. Right, yeah. You just want to go for takes. No, I think it'll be better with the click, won't it? It would be, but this is kind of this is pre-production stuff. This is stuff that should have been done before you. Yeah, in well, the we studio, thought we did have it. Yeah. We well, should have been air practicing. Do you know what I mean? Should we should have had it. Uh, well, we did have it done, didn't we? Well, not really. Not our part. I think one of the positives we took out of the whole blueprint experience was, although that you, you can rehearse for hours and hours and hours, you can never rehearse enough. I'd love to sort of get up at lunchtime and then go and play guitar. And say, say we've got a gig at the night, if we could rehearse for six hours beforehand. I'm sure the first time we play it on the night would sound absolutely brilliant. We've got the track, sounds great, sounds clean, sounds polished. Now we've got to get people listening to it. Right, you've got your CD, now this is where I'm getting back to now, where you've got to try and attract a plugger or a booking agent with that, that CD. I mean, you can go down the route, which every band will do, of sending it off and all that, lot. But you've got to make sure it goes into the hand of the right people. I mean, that's a million dollar question, isn't it, really? It's the fact of just sending it out everywhere. <laughs> The problem is, if it looks crap, who's going to want to listen to it? It's right on it with a big buyer. Do you know what I need to cover? As long as it's got something on the CD which looks smart, otherwise it's just like someone's scribbled on it. Yeah, yeah if, if it'll look like a demo. The idea was to get people talking about the song, create a bit of a buzz around it, ready for the release, you know, bam, here's the tune kind of thing. We got the thing ready to go, we wanted everyone to hear it, we wanted it to look the best we could get it to look. Trying to get the tune on every single radio station that we could think of, every radio station we could find on the internet. I have a very, very, very special track for you by The Man Tells with Men in Suits. Now, there are three P's from Manchester and there's a movement in Manchester to get them into the charts by Christmas. As we have been speaking about for weeks now, we're trying to get an unsigned band into the Christmas chart this year. I'm honoured to say The Man Tells are in the studio. Hello. Time is money, money come time. I imagine every radio presenter goes in and they look at their pigeonhole and they've got, say, I don't know, probably th between, say, maybe 13 or 100 CDs that are all there. And then if you got a CD that came through and it just had a blank CD and someone had scribbled the name on it, it could be, could be absolutely brilliant, but if it comes in next to something that looks really professional, are you gonna, which one are you listen, gonna listen to? We did get a couple of responses from labels basically saying, don't bother. A few of them were just got, all, like, seemingly automated responses saying, you know, we're not really interested in listening to your music. If we, if we know, if we want to hear your music, um, we're interested in you. We'll come and find you. Don't you find us? We went down to the uh, BBC to we try and hand in the uh, CDs to all the, you know, the hosts of the radio shows, all that stuff. Um, and it was obviously before Christmas, so we went down with maybe like some selection boxes, some mince pies, you know, stuff like that. Took it down to Media City for the BBC and um, got told we can't take any suspicious packages. <laughs> so obviously that was a waste of time, but we had some mince pies at the end of it, so it was all right. If you haven't got a really good booking agent, that's the next step. When you've been doing and setting up your own gigs and you've known a few dodgy promoters and you've done this and you've done that, the next step then is getting a booking agent. Now, if you get a decent booking agent, he could book you then 10 dates and you've got to do those 10 dates. You can't go, well, 
I like date number three and I like date number four and I can't do that because I've got my mum's birthday or something like that or I've got a job or I can't do it at work. You've got to do the 10 dates. Now, how many bands that do you know can just sort of like, say, right, 10 dates? Without any hassle from work or family commitment or anything, but that's how keen you've got to be. We've had to give up our jobs, part-time jobs that we had originally, <laughs> our full-time jobs. Um, <laughs> and Josh has had to quit college to do this. I'm the youngest, you see. So Josh is 17. 17. So that's a big thing. It's like when you go on a tour, it's like we've got a tour coming up, it's like 20, 20 odd dates and stuff. And when you go to work and say that first, like, right, okay. But then when you've got another tour in like the next few weeks. It was just becoming, it was just becoming more exactly. and more. It requires you. I was just becoming busier, so. Kind of got lucky at the start, because it was like, what, we only played like six gigs and then we got signed, but before that, we were rehearsed for ages and ages and we, I quit our jobs together. So we really went for it, and like nowadays, it's like people are, people are like, oh, everyone's got kids by that point, and, and you, you, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of hurdles. But we kind of just, came on, I went on the brew and just lived on super noodles, and we looked out for each other, kind. But like a lot of people nowadays are like, oh, I've got, to, I need a job, and before you get peer, before you get pressured into getting a trade or whatever, we were at that point where we could have been swept away and done something else. There's so many talented musicians and artists out there. Um, that just haven't got a shot. Like, for whatever reason, it just, the pieces didn't fall into play. And I know that because I was one of those artists for 15 years. I mean, we, Bill and I were in Pela before this band, and we existed in that band for seven years in New York City. Like, and we started eventually touring the States, but it was hard. I mean, we like we, there were literally some shows we couldn't we couldn't afford to get to the show, um, so we had to cancel the show because we couldn't afford to get there. And that's crazy, especially when towards the end of Pela, like we were selling out shows and we still couldn't afford to get there. We had to borrow money to get to a sold out show. That's insane. But that's the music industry right now. <laughs> The next step is they've organised a launch party. So the launch party uh, was held at a bar in Manchester called the Night and Day Cafe. Well, I didn't wake up, I didn't get out of bed till 5, 5 like, p.m. So I'm still a bit tired. But I've been jumping around and that, you know, getting myself psyched up, like, you know, ready to go. I'm ready to go now, I think. That was a really good success, really. We couldn't have asked for it for much more from that. There was a, there was a couple of hundred people there, and everyone just seemed to, you know, really enjoy the new new tune, um, and it ended up pretty decent night, really, for the launch party. <laughs> If, like you've seen, you know, you, you go after and try to get the song ready and then you get to the studio and it goes on its arse a little bit because of things that you've not really thought would be an issue, you know, stuff like that can be a bit deflating and you think, oh, you know, what a waste of time kind of thing. But when you go out and you do a gig to 200, 250 people, just basically, because everyone's there because you've released one song, do you know what I mean? All them people come here just because you've released a song. Um, it makes it a bit more, a bit more worthwhile. Like people are enjoying what you're doing, and it's it's worth you going, grafting, putting all the hours in, get the tune ready, and all that. For even if it's for that one night, you know, everyone's had a good time, haven't they? What I want to do is when people turn up, I want them to think, well, I'd have paid twice for that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I want people to feel like they got their money's worth and they really were entertained. And now, uh, yeah, and that, it's it's a good feeling. It just perpetuates another great feeling, and that's why it don't you don't mind getting up at five in the morning and going to Gatwick Airport on the night bus with the people who are still having their Saturday night out, <laughs> because there's something at the end of it that is so worthwhile. 
the, 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 the struggling and all that just don't really matter. I, th I think with the 17 week challenge, I don't, I don't think it's a, a, a case of whether you've, you've passed or you've failed with it. I think, I think we've, we've definitely done very well with it and I think it, with, with music, I think it's about kind of getting the ball rolling and keeping things, getting momentum going. Uh, it did much better than I expected it to be, if I'm being completely honest with you. Because um, I thought, you know, getting in the charts, that's a, that's a proper task, that, isn't it? But it, it went all right. I think we'd, enough people had heard about the single before we released it, not just in Manchester, but all, all over the world, it turns out. It got played in Australia, got played in America, Canada. A lot, a lot more places than I really expected it to be. And off the back of it, we've been offered a gig at BL9 Festival, um, which is Happy Mondays and Peter Hook. We sold some CDs, but because of limited funds, we could only sell a limited amount. And they sold out in like an hour or something like that, half an hour, an hour. I think it was a complete success, uh, considering it's been promoted by only three guys, using only social media, using their own time and money. And we managed to we managed to sneak into 140 on the iTunes alternative charts. Only very briefly, but it's a taking part that counts, isn't it? <laughs> We're just going to keep working hard, keep playing gigs, keep on writing tunes and not give up. <laughs>